Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center in Medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. Firefly Credit Union, with locations throughout the Twin Cities, has proudly served Minnesotans since 1925. Firefly guides its members forward by delivering customized financial solutions to improve their lives in all aspects of banking. Firefly Credit Union, they light the way with life illuminated. Edina Eye, physicians and surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years. Now in seven convenient locations, using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services but dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Welcome to Access to Democracy. I'm Bill Raker, guest host for today's edition. We're welcoming as our guest on the program, Jay Hapala, who's the Associate State Director with AARP Minnesota. Uh, Jay, this is your second time on the program. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks very much, Bill. It's good to be with you. Now, Jay, uh, as your role at uh, AARP is, uh, it carries responsibilities for community engagement operations here in Minnesota. So could you elaborate a little bit on, on what it is you really do? <laughs> sure, it, I th and I think it helps to take a step back with the context. Um, with AARP, we're a membership association with a purpose to empower older Americans to have choices they age. And AARP has a headquarters in Washington, D.C., but also state offices in all 50 states. I work in Minnesota here, of course. And uh, part of our work through the state office is to do legislative advocacy, um, work with government officials and decision makers to ensure that older Minnesotans are taken care of. Um, but then the other half of the work is to engage and organize our members and community members to have those relationships and have influence with their elected officials um, and make sure that they, that they have some influence and some say in the issues that affect them. So I spend my time uh, educating and, and connecting with our members and the broader community. Well, one of the things you're responsible for is the Fraud Watch Network, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. But uh, AARP has a, a pretty strong presence or representation here in Minnesota. What's the, the membership for AARP here? Sure. So it's about one out of three Americans over the age of 50 or Minnesotans over the age of 50 who are members. And so in our state, that makes up about, that comes to about 675,000 members here in the state. So that's a good number. Yeah, we're sure glad to have uh, so many people engaged with us. So that's where the influence and the power and just the relevance comes comes from is that we get to listen to our members and and hear from them about what's important to them and then there are there's power in numbers so when it comes to uh, working with our elected officials they know that older people vote and they know that older people um, need rep representation which is certainly true and, and it's very important and uh, one of the things uh, that falls under your responsibility is uh, paying attention to scams and fraud and, and helping to educate people on how to, uh, to avoid them and what to do if they become a victim or think that they become a victim. Why is AARP interested in scams and frauds? 
Yeah, and, it, it, and I'm glad, it's a great question. Thank you. And it's what I was just describing is that we have the chance to listen to our members. So when we ask them what's important to them, right at the top of the list is that people want help when it comes to avoiding scams and protecting their hard-earned savings from these criminals who, um, you know, are targeting us every day, trying to steal that money from from hardworking people. So. Um, so we're because our members care about it so much, and it's and and we have some connections. We bring together um, law enforcement agencies, social services, um, private industry, uh, lo a lot of different people who have an interest in protecting uh, people from financial crime, and we work together to prevent it. So that's really embedded uh, in AARP's mission. I would say so. We're empowering people to have choice. You know, their financial security uh, doesn't amount to much if uh, they're victimized by a crime and lose a lot of money. So we mentioned just uh, a little bit earlier that you are in charge of the Fraud Watch Network. Tell us a little bit about what that is, who it is, what it does. Sure. It's, it's a program. So it's an educational program that I operate here in the state. Uh, but it also, on a bigger scale, is very much a network. So, um, again, we're listening to our members and we're collecting information from various sources to understand the trends and, and what's happening with scams. What are the, what are the current um, scams that people are getting on their telephone or uh, on the Internet and through email or through other means or communication methods? Uh, and then we take all that information and we try to educate the public so that they can stay a step ahead of the con artists. And we do that in a variety of ways, whether it's our own communications, um, whether it is events and, and, you know, nowadays online webinars that people can participate in uh, to learn about scams and other financial crime issues. Uh, because with these issues of financial crime, really education is one of the best tools that we have. The criminals have the upper hand in a lot of ways. They can cover their tracks and communicate anonymously. So it's really hard for law enforcement to trace the criminals and catch them before they strike again. So instead, we just really need all of us to be vigilant, uh, to help each other, and to get educated about scams and identity theft so we can stop it before it happens. Sure. Well, I, I saw a recent statistic that says since the first of the year, uh, scams are up 400 percent from what they were a year ago because of COVID-19. What is it about this pandemic environment that we're in that that makes the scammers so active and, uh, you know, the rest of us more vulnerable as victims? Sure. Well, not to disagree with you, but there, in the early days of the pandemic, I just find this interesting that there was a pretty steep drop off in the number of robocall scams that were coming out. And that's because the scammers who were working in these office building call centers uh, all had their buildings closed so they couldn't, they couldn't get on the phone and call people. So some of those robocall scams went down right away. But I guess in more seriousness, yes, uh, we've seen a big increase in scams and, and maybe it's an old cliche, but I call it a perfect storm that this that pandemic has created when it comes to scams and, and our vulnerability because we're living in this time of uncertainty and fear for a lot of people from, from the pandemic. And so just that emotional state we find ourselves living in makes us more vulnerable and it's a matter of our you know brain chemistry and just our uh the way that we operate as part of our society so it's that fear um and emotion that we're all experiencing um, it's also the isolation so here we are at home instead of meeting up at the studio to tape and tape a art or a episode like this and so just by this nature we're more isolated for, from each other and and many people have it worse than us maybe they live alone and they really don't have family and friends who they can check in with on the computer uh, and so anyway people are just more isolated and that's just what the con artists need in order to you know take money from their victims uh, and there are other factors just the same uh, many people are using new computer technology that they're not familiar with and it's a wonderful technology that we have access to um, but the con artists have it too, 
And when a person is unfamiliar with, say, using a video conference system or even uh, a new kind of website to communicate, they could be vulnerable because they just don't know how it works. So it, in a lot of ways where everyone, not just older people, but everyone is more vulnerable to financial crime in the, the current state we're living in. Now, so what are the, some of the more common scams here in, in Minnesota? And are we seeing any new types of scams because of the pandemic? Yeah, definitely. As I've been talking with community groups here in the, in the past months, I had been describing the, the increase in the type of common scams we're seeing, some as being new coronavirus or COVID related scams, and others as being an increase in old scams that just have a new twist or have some new power because of the pandemic. So there are certain, well, I'll start with the common scams that, that are new and have to do with the pandemic. And there are people still out there selling fake cures and, and offering um, uh, treatments for coronavirus. But we know, you know, as of right now in September 2020, there's no cure for coronavirus. So anyone stating that is obviously a scam. Um, they're getting involved with uh, contact tracing scams. So I know some scam victims have received text messages and that text message informs them that they have come into contact with someone else who has COVID-19 and they're encouraged to click on the link to participate in contact tracing. Um, and I'll pause just to say what, what are the contact con artist after in this scenario. Uh, clicking on that link, it could lead to a form where they want to, the scammers are collecting personal information from their victim. It could be a request for money that they would say, because you were exposed to coronavirus, you have to pay a certain amount of money and we want your credit card number or else you're gonna get in trouble with the law. Um, or it could be a, an attempt to infect that victim's a device with a virus. I don't know if there's any computer viruses called COVID-19, but it, it could be an attempt to infect the vi or device with a virus. So that was just a little pause to see what, what could a text message be leading someone into. Um, legitimate contact tracers, with, because it, contact tracing is a really important step in our fight against this pandemic, um, one, they, a contact tracer doesn't need a lot of personal information about someone who's been exposed to COVID. They don't even need that person's birth date or they certainly don't need their social security number. So that's just not necessary. And then in Minnesota, you know, the state of, the state of Minnesota is operating a, a helpline where anyone can call to get answers about what all of these new uncertain um, changes that we're going through, like the need to perhaps participate in contact tracing so they can verify that that is a, a real request. There's a lot of vulnerability uh, out there right now because of the pandemic situation that we're in. Do you have any recommendations for precautions that the consumer can take to, to help you know, protect themselves or, or to prevent becoming a victim of any of these scams? Yeah, absolutely. I think with, you know, anything coronavirus related, if it's, if a person's being solicited, if, if they're not the one reaching out and trying to get information, uh, you know, if they're getting a text message or an email or a phone call requesting information, it's a big red flag and it's time to slow down and talk to the officials, whether that is, someone at your bank or whether that, you know, in the appropriate situation it, or, you know, talk with your healthcare provider about testing or treatments. Um, don't just listen to the person who's calling on the phone and explaining how things should be. So that's, I guess, to start with, it's about being cautious um, and not letting, and, and knowing oneself. So when a person starts to have that emotional response to, what is likely a scam, uh, knowing that response should be a red flag for someone to slow down and get some trusted advice. Yeah, I've, I've read that uh, humans are wired in such a way that, that under emotional stress and pressure, 
uh, we, we tend to make not so good financial decisions. Uh, and so that's what the scammer sets us up for. Right. You said it. You said it best. Um, it's just the way our brains are wired. And the scammers know it. Oh, they do. They do for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah, They're always one ahead of us. You know, I think that uh, one of the, the ways that we can avoid becoming victims is, is knowing about the potential kinds of scams in advance and what, what to look for when we suspect that there's something at play there that, that could lead us into fraud, uh, which that awareness is, you know, we develop from education and, and from becoming uh, more aware of, of what's happening out there. What are some of the initiatives that AARP has underway to, that are related to fraud and, and fraud prevention and, and uh, help for the victims? Well, folks can certainly enroll in our Fraud Watch Network and be a part of that um, team of people across the country who are monitoring and reporting scams. Uh, the website is aarp.org slash Fraud Watch Network. And like I've said, a person can sign up to join the network and then they receive alerts a couple times a month when we will inform people about current trends that we're monitoring and that are being reported to us. But then also it's a good reminder that if a person sees a scan on their phone or their computer or wherever they might find it, they can report it so that others can, can know too. Well, let's talk a little bit more about reporting a scam or uh, that we, we may see that's being played out somewhere and it doesn't necessarily involve us personally, but maybe it does. But if it does involve us personally and we want to report the scam, uh, you know, there's a place on the AARP website where we can do that. Uh, but a, a person does not have to be a member of AARP to, to do that, right? That's true. This CrowdWatch Network program is open to people of all ages. You don't even have to be over 50. How about that? And oh, you that's even better. Have to be a member. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and there's the website and people can start there, but there's also a phone number where people can call and, and get help because when it comes to reporting, uh, in our country and in our state, there are so many different government agencies that play a role in investigating financial fraud and 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 helping victims of different types of fraud. So it might be a different agency that can help a victim if they were uh, impacted over the internet versus the telephone and depending how the money was sent. So it could be very confusing for a crime victim to know where to go for help. That's why we have our 800 number where people can call and with our, our team on this phone call or this phone line will help people help the victims figure out where they're supposed to go for help. Uh, which agency. And that number is 877-908-3360. We'll have that repeated later in the program, Jay, and it'll also be on the, the program when it goes out for viewing. So, so thank you for, for sharing that. And I, you, you mentioned another important point to understand is that if one uh, is reporting uh, a scam, that and they talk to the AARP representatives that it's not just reporting that that's a resource where they can get counseling if you will or they can get guidance on what they should do next and, and how to handle the situation that they're in right well, the first step is to stop the scam from happening so often people once they victims once they realize that they might have made a mistake or they they you know, got involved in something, it could still be happening. So step one, let's make sure we stop it from happening. Um, step two, make sure the financial accounts are, are in good order. And if there needs to be new account numbers issued or such, that's a step in the process. And then there might be long-term identity theft protection that is recommended or really needed by the victim to ensure that, say, their information isn't sold on to the next scammer who will t pick up the baton and, and try to scam them again. Sure. But what are the top three or four scams being reported and dealt with here in Minnesota right now? 
Yeah, I'm glad you asked again, because before I was just focused on those coronavirus scams. But really, some of the top scams are still the same old, the same old um, scams from before, except for they might have a little more of a coronavirus twist. And the top one still is, uh, and has been for a while now, is about uh, people who purchase things online, and then what they purchase doesn't show up, or it's vastly different from what they expected. Um, it, if any of the viewers out there, I'm sure you are, are shopping online more now than you were before we were all stuck at home, largely. Um, you know, you've seen these websites and, and they pop up on your screen and they promise you a deal on something you've been searching for. Um, but it was probably too good to be true because um, when it arrives, it's not what you expected, if it ever does arrive. So there's a lot of these fake websites out there. Um, either just collecting people's credit card numbers or selling substandard uh, merchandise. I, I read recently that the, the number one reported scam right now in the United States uh, is like the imposter, it is the imposter phone call, where you mm -hmm. get a phone call and uh, the, the, the person on the other end of the phone says that they uh, represent the uh, Social Security Administration in some way. So it's a Social Security related call. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what's going on there and, and what's the red flag uh, on a call like that and wh what should the uh, consumer do with it? Sure, so the, that was actually the next one I was, was gonna list as being of the most common right now. Uh, and the one we're hearing a lot about is people are getting a phone call and whether it's a recording or whether it's live, it says your social security number has been reported and it's been involved in a crime down in Texas. And so you better respond to us or else you're going to get in trouble because there's been some serious crimes committed with your social security number. So that fear tactic we know is even more powerful than the promise of prizes or winnings, you know, compare that fear factor about being mistakenly involved in a crime versus learning that you've won the lottery and that you have to respond to some sort of a, a request for information. Um, they're both can be powerful, but people tend to respond even more strongly to that fear factor. Um, and then if someone got involved with that crime scam, they would be requesting personal information, if they're dealing with the scammer, they might eventually ask for some money to pay for a new identity or some other, some other scam like that. So uh, just so, like I was describing earlier, any scam can be a request for personal information. It can be a request or a demand for money. Um, it could be a, a, a way to get access to the victim's device or their online accounts. Let's uh, shift to, to hacking. Uh, the, the cyber hack, uh, you know, what can we do to protect ourselves from having our computers or our phones being hacked? Sure, good question. And, you know, there are some basic steps that folks need to take, and it starts with uh, security software on their devices and on their network. Um, when you purchase a new computer nowadays or you get your modem from the internet service provider, those come with top of the line security. Um, however, it's up to the consumer to keep, the, keep that software up to date. So uh, whether it's running the updates on your smartphone or making sure that you run the updates on your antivirus software on your, on your computer, those are important steps to take. Um, but when it comes to people being victimized online um, in scams. I hesitate to use the word hack, hacking because more often it is that the victim is actually social, socially engineered into handing over information uh, online that the scammers can use to either access their finances, to impersonate them and steal their identity or access their online accounts. So typically instead of a, a hacking in through their security software. Instead, the attack comes through an email and it looks like it might be from your bank. And it looks like your banker is requesting information about your bank account and the unwitting victims send that information along and then the hacker 
hacker or the this uh, scammer has the information they need in order to access their victims' finances. Well, the, one of the takeaways from that is that we can never be too cautious. We, we, we constantly need to be aware of how to protect our privacy and the confidentiality of our identity and, and our records. Um, any final thoughts that you'd like to, to leave with our viewers on this program? Gosh, after all these years, I've been meeting with community groups and just hearing people's concerns about scams and identity theft. You know, there's a lot we can do to educate ourselves and, and understand what the scammers are trying to do. We can pay close attention to our finances and our credit and do everything right to make sure we're monitoring our, our money. But, you know, what it comes down to in a lot of cases is that people make financial decisions all alone and they end up making mistakes. And that's part of our culture because uh, for whatever reason, we don't talk about money. A lot of people don't talk about their financial decisions with their family and the people they trust. And then they end up isolated sort of like a puppet on a string with these con artists who are so good at uh, victimizing people. So I say, if only we could change the way we make decisions about money, talk with the people we trust, talk with our loved ones about financial decisions, we'd be um, really stronger as a it, united against the criminals who are trying to separate us out of the herd. And part of that work that you do involves uh, a lot of volunteers who work in the Fraud Watch Network and, and other uh, uh, volunteer opportunities within AARP. So uh, if you're in need of new and additional volunteers, you can put out your call for volunteers to contact you. Absolutely. Potential volunteers. You, you save, yeah, you save the day, Bill. I'd be in trouble if we didn't get to this. But the, the network is made up of volunteers. Um, we have uh, dozens and dozens of people across the state of Minnesota who take this information, they bring it to their own communities, whether that is a Zoom meeting with their, with their friends or whether it's around the dinner table with their, with their family. Um, they're sharing this information and helping each other out. So uh, it's easy to contact us with AARP Minnesota and we'll get you started as a fraud fighter right away. No, oh, that's great, Jay. You know, before we leave, can you give us that number that, at AARP for reporting a scam or a fraud transaction? Give it to us one more time. Sure, 877-908-3360. Terrific, terrific. Well, our guest today has been uh, Jay Hapala, who's the state direct, associate state director for uh, AARP here in Minnesota and uh, is, has the responsibility for AARP operations. So, Jay, thank you for sharing with us uh, some terrific information, very helpful, very useful about being more aware of scams, how to avoid them, and then what to do if, God forbid, we, we fall victim to such a thing. So, uh, thank you so much, Jay. It's been a great interview. Thank you. Be safe out there. Yeah, stay well.